Do we understand hurricanes? Well, we're getting a whole lot better at predicting individual storms. Um, this has really been a banner year for you know long range prediction and detailed prediction of hurricane impacts. So models like ECMWF and the NOAA models, they're doing a good job. Um, so we understand the basics of how hurricanes form and we have a predictive capability using high resolution global and regional um, weather forecast models. Uh, we don't understand rapid intensification like Hurricane Harvey this year, it spun up very, very quickly, uh, rapidly intensified, you know, in less than 24 hours. We don't know how to predict that much in advance um, at all. But in terms of track and overall intensity, um, rainfall impacts, we're getting pretty good at being able to predict that. Uh, my company, Climate Forecast Applications Network, hurricane forecasting is a big part of what we do. And, and we've had a really good year um, for our predictions. What do we know about looking backward in the past? What do we know about the rate of change of the intensity of hurricanes or the frequency of occurrence? Well, in terms of, well, we only have good satellite data back to maybe 1980. We have some satellite data going back to 1970, but, you know, it, it's um, of lesser quality. Um, so we don't have long global records, but in the Atlantic, we have pretty good historical records at least for the landfalling hurricanes, it, you know, not necessarily for the total number in the basins. So um, in, for the satellite record globally, there's no trend um, in the numbers or overall um, accumulated cyclone energy. We have teased out a signal of an increasing percentage of category four and five hurricanes um, in two of the basins in the Atlantic and the North Indian Ocean. But trying to determine whether this is natural variability or human caused, uh, you know, we just don't have a long enough record to tease that out. So there are hints um, of you know, an increasing percentage of category four and five hurricanes, but we don't have the knowledge or enough data to attribute that to humans versus natural variability. But some people have said, as a result of uh, Hurricane Harvey and Irma, that we live in a warmer world, the oceans are warmer, the sea level is higher, and this is going to make hurricanes more destructive. Do you think of well, that? Well, can, can they then tell me why we've had no major hurricane strikes in the U.S. for the 12 years preceding Hurricane Harvey? Um, you know, so sea surface temperature is only one ingredient um, for hurricane development and intensification. And it doesn't seem to just be absolute sea surface temperature either. I mean, you can go back and there were really strong hurricanes, you know, in, in the 19th century, for example, when surface temperatures were significantly cooler. So, and there were some horrendous hurricanes in the first, in the Atlantic, in the uh, early part of the 20th century, when sea surface temperatures were noticeably cooler. So it's more relative sea surface temperature and the overall dynamics of the atmosphere um, that are the arguably the key ingredients, not just absolute sea surface temperature itself. So that, 
you know, why, why we can, we have a pretty good predictive capability of hurricanes right now. Our understanding of the climate dynamics of hurricanes is a different story. This is something that's still a work in progress. It's a lot of debate um, in the scientific community about this. And we're only now starting to see some high resolution global climate model simulations trying to sort out um, what we might see in the future. There was a paper just published by a Japanese group, and I think I might have seen this yesterday. My apologies to the group for not remembering the names off the top of my head, but they ran the very high resolution Japanese um, climate model for the current conditions and you know, perturbed warmer conditions. And they found a significant decrease in the number of hurricanes, but they found an increase in intensity, an increase in the horizontal size, which relates to storm surge, among other things, and an increase in precipitation. So um, I think, you know, I just glanced at it literally yesterday. I flagged it to read more carefully. Um, but that may be the best study that I've seen of that kind. Um, so for the sake of argument, assume that is correct. You know, what's the trade-off for 20% fewer hurricanes for a slight increase in overall intensity? In terms of overall damage, you know, I don't know what the trade-off is. <laughs> So that it might not be a net increase in actual damage if there's fewer hurricanes. So, you know, that's the state of our understanding right now. Um, so given the uh, model, what the models say, what people might say happen in the future, how long will it be before we are observationally able to compare what's happening with the models? Um, and even the, like, Carrie Emanuel has made the statement that it'd really be mid-21st century before we'd expect to see any climatological signal in the observations, because natural variability is so large, um, and weather roulette, you know, <laughs> you know, just sometimes crazy things happen, and they don't have anything to do with climate. So, So by the time you have a long enough time, and this is assumed that we have some substantial warming <laughs> over the next 30 years. If we do have substantial warming over the next 30 years, probably by 2050, we would start to be able to tease out a signal. But, okay, looking at that period, the next 30 years, um, we're probably looking at a shift in the Atlantic to the cool phase of the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation. Um, in 1995, after a relatively quiet period in the Atlantic, we flipped to the warm phase of um, the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, and that like really juiced up the hurricanes. And so at some time, probably order 10 years, we'll see a flip to the cool phase again, and presumably much quieter situation in the Atlantic for hurricanes. So are those who point to Harvey and Irma as being climate change in action, are they mistaking weather for climate? Oh yes, they're mistaking weather for climate. Uh, Harvey and Irma were big storms, but they don't really rank up anywhere near as the worst that we've seen in the last decade or the last century. There were some horrendous ones earlier in the 20th century, um, including really bad ones that hit Houston and Florida. So, you know, these aren't particularly unusual um, as far as hurricanes go. I mean, you know, they're top 20 you know, kind of storms, but they're not record breaking in any way, um, apart from the overall rainfall from Harvey, which was really more a fluke of the weather situation. It allowed the storm to sit in one place for a very long time. 
Um, so there's nothing particularly unusual about this hurricane season or about Harvey and Irma. I mean, the U.S. had an incredibly lucky run of 12 years without a major U.S. landfall, you know, during this active phase, you know, of the hurricane cycle. So we were incredibly lucky. And, you know, our luck is now broke, um, but it's, you know, totally expected. Can I ask you finally about event attribution? Because there are people saying that, that Hurricane Harvey wouldn't have happened without climate change. There are people say that the heat wave in Russia was made 10 times more likely because of climate change or the drought in America was made X times more likely. Can I ask you what you think about scientists who try and attribute individual events to climate change in a direct way? Um, the group that I like is really the NOAA group in Boulder who looks at the historical record and tries to see is there anything unusual here? You know, for the, you know, looking back a hundred years, is this exceptional in any way? And if it's not particularly exceptional, given the record we have for the last hundred years, then it's hard to argue that it's climate change. Occasionally we do get genuinely record-breaking events, okay, then we need to trace back, um, you know, what was the atmospheric dynamics and whatever that contributed to that event, and you need to tease it out. So, um, it needs a lot of detective work that there's this new movement to use climate models um, with natural variability and then human caused global warming. But these same climate models they're using can't resolve these extreme events. They can't, um, they can't produce hurricanes. They don't have the right um, event weather distribution to provide heat waves. So, it, it, it's just sort of voodoo statistics that they're playing with with these models who don't have the capability to predict these extreme events in the current climate or in an unperturbed climate anyways. So I'm not very impressed with the model-based attribution arguments. Carefully constructed diagnostic analysis and comparisons with historical events to me those are of much more value so we have to wait and see so we just have to wait and see um, the, in, in the I the IPCC fifth assessment report introduces concept of time of emergence when you would expect to see the statistics of the um, future climate break out from these you know the variability statistics of the current climate, and they come up with something like 2050, you know, so we're just not able to see a signal, you know, where the statistics would be genuinely different from what we have now. Um, so we're just not able to see that. Um, and I don't quite understand the rash, you know, why it's important to attribute these extreme events other than to hysterically advocate for reducing fossil fuels. I, I mean, in, in terms of trying to figure out how to manage extreme events and reduce our vulnerability, um, what's causing it is almost a secondary concern. I mean, when you're trying to, I mean, we're, we're not, preparing for the events we have now or the events we've seen in the 20th century, let alone for the events that we might see in the latter part of the 21st century. You know, if we have enough money for that extra resilience, wow, that would be great to prepare for even, you know, bigger events than we've seen. But, you know, adapting and preparing for the ones we're seeing now would be a big step in the right direction to reducing our vulnerability to what we might be facing in the future. And thinking that reducing fossil fuels is going to help with extreme events on the time scale of the 21st century is a pipe dream. Even if you believe the climate models and, 
and we are able to drastically reduce fossil fuel emissions by 2050, we're, we're going to see minuscule impacts on the climate and the weather by the end of the 21st century. Um, any benefits would be realized in the 22nd and the 23rd centuries, you know, and, you know, if we think we have enough wisdom and knowledge to deal with what might happen in the 22nd and the 23rd century. Well, personally, I'd rather see us deal with the here and now and maybe focus on what we might be facing out to 2050. That seems a more practical and realistic goal um, for what we should be trying to do. It's my opinion. Thank you very much. Is there anything you want to add?